Felix here. Good evening from Hong Kong. Good morning to most of you. Welcome to this pre-market live stream chat. This is as interactive as it gets, so don't be shy. Ask your questions in the little chat thing there. All you got to do is hit subscribe for it. Uh, that's the only commitment you got to make there. Now, what's happening this morning? We've got lots to talk through and, of course, lots of your questions to answer. Let me show you this to start with. This is These are the, the futures. Um, so this is the future, basically, and the future is red. Uh, the future is deep red. Well, not that deep red, but everything is down basically half a percent. Dow Jones, S&P, and NASDAQ. And that's fairly unusual because most of the time we're seeing either the NASDAQ going down or the Dow Jones index, usually not both together. So at the same time, volatility also going up. And the, the shining beacon, as always, is orange juice. <laughs> Put all your money into orange juice. No, that's a joke. Don't do that. As always, this is not financial advice. This is just for entertainment only. Please always bear that in mind. Please be smart about it. And let me show you what I've got in stock for you. We're going to run through some of the, the news, some of the headline stuff. We're going to look at retail sales numbers, what that means. And then we are definitely going to look at, uh, well, we're going to look at Palantir and their gold buying spree. And we're looking at the Neo lawsuit to really uh, see what that's all about. I've got the actual text open here from the IPO filing. Uh, and that's really what they are focusing on in that lawsuit. So we're going to dig deeper into that. So lots of you guys here, which is wonderful. A huge welcome to everybody. Let's run through a couple of headline news, which will partly explain, uh, Jaya, your question, for example, uh, why are we in the red? Or Chris, huge welcome to you, uh, saying, you know, brutal start to the week. Uh, Howard, Fernando, uh, welcome to you guys. So the first number we have out here, I screenshot at the top. This came out at 7.30 a.m. New York time. Retail sales numbers. And what were we expecting? Well, we were expecting, let me grab a little pen here, we were expecting to get minus 0.3%. So we were expecting retail sales to fall month on month. I think that might have something to do with holidays. People are not out shopping as much. But what did we get? We got minus 1.1. That's substantially worse than expected. And then if you exclude autos, car uh, uh, purchasing, we were actually expecting a slight improvement in sort of the normal retail world, but we actually got 0.4% minus again. So that's not great for like the real world economy. I'm not talking the tech stocks here, but for your, you know, your real retail shops, for your uh, your Walmarts, your Home Depot and those kind of places. And of course, your, your, your sort of average um, you know, high street, uh, main street shops. Uh, that isn't good news. It just means people are cautious. People are more cautious on spending and COVID and everything else than we, well, economists certainly were thinking. Uh, there also, I've written down here, well, a, a couple of things just to give us a little bit of a headline start here. So there are concerns on more lockdowns. Uh, Biden just, just announced that all Americans are going to need a booster shot. Now that's a booster for pharmaceuticals perhaps, although I'll also show you why uh, that might perhaps be not the greatest timing. Uh, we've got treasury yields coming down a little bit, so that's the 10-year bond yield because uh, Powell is going to speak apparently today, but I didn't see the date. I looked it up on his diary. Normally everything is in there, but this one wasn't. But he's talking about the health of the economy. So, you know, uh, does he ever say anything wonderful? Does the market love what he says? Usually not. We also have um, Home Depot actually with very good numbers, but they had weaker, so they had good kind of profitability numbers, but uh, weaker than expected. Comp sales dragged down shares down lower. And we also have one of the Fed Bank presidents Eric Rosengren, is it Gren or Green? Uh, either way, he said that he's be prepared to begin rolling back stimulus this fall. So that's more kind of aggressive language there from the Fed, which markets are definitely not going to love overall. In China, we've got more wonderful news, which is more regulatory stuff. And basically, they've put out a um, public consultation on tackling unfair competition online. And 
Uh, obviously, what falls off a cliff when that happens? Well, Tencent and Barber and Meituan and JD and everybody else who has a dominant market share, DD and so on. And basically, there are draft regulations circling uh, which ban unfair competition and restrict the use of user data. And if you are an online business, user data is kind of where it's at. That's really your value here. So this, again, not great. And I think, and I've been saying this now for some weeks, there will be a lot more knocks like that till the end of the year. That doesn't mean that Chinese stocks are a terrible thing to be in. It's just going to take some time for things to sort of turn around there. Uh, of course, people are also watching the news from Kabul, Afghanistan. That doesn't look particularly great, does it? Are people desperate to flee? Basically, the Taliban took over in about a week. So what was it all for, those 21 years? But that's not really what, I guess, worries investors. It's more what happens to the stability of the region, what happens to the mining that was meant to take place in Afghanistan, what happens to their neighbors, which are you know places like Pakistan, China, Iran, and so on. Uh, so the whole stability of that area and perhaps the Middle East and, and so on uh, is, is, is an issue on people's minds. And the markets do not like uncertainty, and we just got a load of it here. So Asian stocks basically are, are, are down, and that's where I am here in Hong Kong. Uh, not a great day because of all the stuff that's coming out of China in terms of regulation. And a couple of updates here on a few companies that are fairly popular. Don't worry, I'm not going to run through everything that happened today. But C Limited put out earnings. And I know a lot of people love C Limited as a sort of Alibaba alternative. They reported an earnings per share loss of 61 cents. We were expecting 52. So this is worse than expected. But the revenues are substantially up and they also have 45% active user growth and they are basically um, giving us very, very good upward guidance. So actually sort of mixed news, but forward looking, at least they're looking very good. And then talking of pharma, I was saying, well, pharma is going to benefit from all these booster shots right? that'll be going to be given for the rest of our lives probably. Uh, but Berkshire Hathaway has sold a lot of pharma stuff so they cut their stake in Merck by 48%, uh, in ABBV by 10%, Bristol Myers, Squip, what happened to the Squip, <laughs> by, by 15%, and they exited Biogen completely, according to their filing. Now, why would they have done that when you think there is all this booster shop money coming? Well, I think the way a value investor kind of ticks is that they saw the opportunity, they've taken it, and they now think the valuations are sufficiently high to go in and take some profits. And you have to really respect them for that, to walk away with profits and, and not worry about taking every last cent. In, and that's a really hard thing to do is to exit. Now, what I mentioned here is, is Baidu, Baba, DDJD, and so on, uh, basically also falling because the SEC chair, Gary Gensler, our new friend, is again issued some sort of warning about the risk in investing in Chinese companies. So combine that all together and, and you start with a pretty red day. Now, let me have a look at some of your questions here. Uh, Yon Chu, hello there to Korea. PG, uh, great to have you on the call here. Nicholas G H. Uh, S. Confucius, um, I still don't see the delisting, uh, to be honest with you, of the ADSs. I think that would still be too big of a shot in the foot of the U.S. financial industry because there are like 100, sort of 174 or something ADSs in the U.S. And obviously, you know, those American depository shares are actually issued by American banks. So they make money out of the whole process and all the advisory and everything else. So I still don't see that. And GH says, medical stocks are beyond my circle of competence, so I can't give an opinion. You know what? That's precisely why I don't buy medical stocks, because I'm not qualified and I don't understand it. I don't know whether I'm too early, too late, or buying the right or the wrong thing um, at all. Roti says, great day for options. Indeed, volatility going up. Uh, that always brings some nice opportunities here. Stefan, also, I'm very glad you're joining me for the call here. Adam says, perhaps fully autonomous autos are just a pipe dream. So we have that crash, right? We have that Neo crash. Let me see if I've got anything on that here. here. Uh, well, we'll definitely, let's talk about Neo a little bit here. So we do have that crash in, in, in China of an ES8, apparently, which had NOP on, which is sort of, it's not autonomous driving. It's a driver assist program. It's level two autonomous driving. So it's not meant to take over. Apparently, level two autonomous driving isn't very good at spotting stationary objects, which is a bit of a problem. And that's exactly what that car hit. He was driving on the highway and in front of him was a maintenance service maintenance 
truck parked, probably with lights flashing and so on, uh, one of those big arrows going, you know, change lanes, and he hit that. And it killed the driver, unfortunately. Now, does that mean autonomous driving is a bad idea? No. It's kind of like saying, well, you know, if, if you if you basically, if you think that, you should never cross the road or get on a plane or a train or anything. There is an inherent risk in everything. Statistically, autonomous driving will be much, much safer than you and me driving because it doesn't get distracted by thoughts or, you know, nagging passengers or mobile phones or the, the radio or, or whatever else. So, but it isn't, of course, just with like the Tesla crashes. It's not great for the image of EVs. It's not great for the image of Neo. Um, but it's just one of those things. The more cars you sell, the more often this will happen. And I imagine this is probably the same when, you know, I don't know, Rolls-Royce put out their first car in, I don't know, 1906 or something. And people were saying, those cars kill people because they did occasionally. Uh, but that still doesn't mean that people kept you know, riding around on horses and thought that that was superior at the end of the road. So I think this is going to happen. In China, it's going to happen first. There has been some commentary from the Chinese government saying car companies should focus on safety and not on fancy features, which is, I think, the SMAR who said that, which is obviously guidance. And I'm sure the Neo Xpang and so on are listening to that. And they're going to throw a lot of money at security and safety. I do think in the long run, that's what it's going to deliver. But, you know, you, you are going to get these blips here. Um, and just enough says sex kids. He has heard by a Tesla crash in the UK yesterday too. Thanks for sharing that. But, you know, you, you are not telling me how many people got killed in a Ford yesterday, right? Or, a, a, you know, because it just happens all the time and it's normal and it's acceptable. It's just this is new technology. Therefore, it makes the headlines. Samuel, glad of you two joining us. Um, and Learning to Fly says everything is basically negative on Chinese stocks. And you know what? I don't want to be a doomsayer on this, but I think this is going to continue until year end. I do think uh, that Chinese stocks are going to have a fairly tough year. Uh, George says hello from Germany. Uh, and let me see. <laughs> yep says autonomous driving is at Sputnik levels. It's going to take some time to go to Mars. And yes, I also agree with you on that. It's going to take some time uh, for that. And Shock said you're saying Tesla is still the safest. Tesla is still the safest car in the world. You know what? It probably is because all the sensors and so on will actually make it much much harder for you to hit that tree, right? So. Glenn says 3,700 people die every day in auto crashes. Is that just in the United States, Glenn? Uh, but yeah. So you know we don't talk through each one of those 3,700 people, as tragic as that is, uh, but we talk about the one that hit a stationary service vehicle. I mean, he must have been asleep. I mean, I, you know, I don't wish to say anything negative about somebody who's died. Obviously, it's incredibly unfortunate, but you know, you know what it's like. You drive on the highway, there is one arrow, it says construction coming up, change lanes, and there's another arrow, and then there's another one, and then, you know, uh, then there is the, the vehicle standing there. So it's usually not a surprise unless you really were completely distracted or asleep. So I don't think you can necessarily blame the car for that. But that's exactly what's going to happen here. Now, shall we talk about Neo Lawsuit just a little bit? So this is what it's all about. So this lawsuit is um, organized by the most prolific security class action law firm. They are called Rosen something or other. Uh, here, the Rosen Law Firm. And if you just Google them, literally type them into Google News and you see they've got one going at the moment against uh, Tarina International. They've got one going against HomePoint. Uh, they are uh, doing one against Axum Therapeutics, another one against PayPal, another one against, I don't know what, you know, they are just loads, Blue City, Piemont Lithium, that's what they do, right? So they, they, they basically look for things that could somehow be twisted into a lawsuit and they then, I think, uh, this is my speculation, hope that this gets settled uh, or they might get an award and, you know, juries uh, judge these things, juries often don't see the nitty-gritty technical stuff uh, of an of an S1 filing, and they might therefore find in favor of the of the plaintiffs. So, what is it all about? They're basically saying, look, in the IPO, Neo said, and I'm going to run through this quickly. Neo said, we are building a, we are constructing a factory, our own factory in Shanghai, and they didn't. And I don't know if you remember that, but this is the chart up here. So in March tw in 2019, excuse my 
horrific handwriting. In, in March uh, 2019, NIO announced that they weren't building that factory after all. And the share price did that little little slide here, which seems tiny now, but it went from $10 to 7 which was obviously a pretty dramatic move, right? So lost 30% in a, in a couple of days because people were thinking, well, who's going to build these cars? So what the Rosen people are saying, the law firm, is that, well, the cars are now being built by some sort of shoddy semi-state-owned company called JAC, and that's not what our shareholders signed up for. Our shareholders wanted their own factory, and therefore they deserve those $3 back or more. Uh, and that's basically what it's all about. Now, this is the paragraph in the IPO filing which talks about the construction. So what does it say? It says, we are developing our own manufacturing facility in Shanghai. This is you know, from the date of the IPO, which we expect to be ready by the end of 2020. Such manufacturing facility currently being constructed by relevant Shanghai authorities. As a result, such construction is largely outside of our control and could experience delays or other difficulties. And then it goes through a whole list of reasons why under Chinese law, construction projects may or may not happen. And they need all sorts of permits. And there is lots of administrative uncertainty. Uh, they could be suspended uh, and so on. And then they say down here in red, uh, in addition to the extent we are unable to successfully complete construction on time or at all. So the way I read this is that they said, yeah, we're doing this construction, but it may or may not happen. That's basically what it says in a lot of words. Uh, so are they going to be successful with this lawsuit? Now, I'm in no position to give advice on that. I might have been a, a UK lawyer at one point. I'm no longer, and I'm certainly no, no American securities attorney. Uh, but there are a lot of caveats in here, a lot, a lot of disclaimers of why this may or may not happen. Uh, and the whole uh, IPO filing is full of those things. That's basically what those 300 pages are for. It's, you know, 10 pages information and then 290 pages of covering your backside. So I think pretty hard to be successful with this, with this from my point of view, but that doesn't mean they're not going to try and have a go at it. So what did the judge just say? The judge just said, I'm not going to throw this out without having a hearing. So that's always what you do as a defendant. Uh, you get your lawyers, and Neo has a very ex a really truly excellent U.S. law firm called Scadden Arps. Uh, that's really top of the tree in the U.S. legal industry. And they basically said, look, there is no merit to this. Just throw it out. And the judge said, okay, I, I hear what you're saying, but we are going to have a hearing and you can make your make your arguments in a proper hearing. So that's what's going to happen. Uh, so that will be a little bit more, more bad news uh, coverage there for a little while. Now, they did win a case against Alibaba after the IPO some years back, and they got 250 million US dollars. Now, say if that were to happen to Neo, would it would it actually affect their business? No, it wouldn't. It gets a one-off payment. They've got the cash. So no, I don't think it would actually affect the sort of ongoing ability to perform the business and grow particularly. So uh, let's hope it, that doesn't happen, but I just wanted to really explain what this is all about, and I hope that makes it a little bit clearer. All right, let me look at some questions here, uh, because I appreciate you guys are chatting away. Uh, Pazuzil is saying, uh, thank you very much for calling it a great channel. I appreciate that. Uh, how far do you think Chinese stocks have to fall before the price is low enough to compensate for the risk? Look, I mean, there are stocks that I think are very cheap to me. Look, look at Alibaba. I thought Alibaba was cheap at $210. Now we're at whatever, 180. It's, it is cheap. So the question isn't really one of cheapness. The question is one of opportunity cost. So if you buy this now and it doesn't perform for 12 months, and say QQQ does 15% in those 12 months, you've lost 15%. It means in the follow-up period, you have to recover that 15% to grow. And in a way, actually even more because your QQQ will compound. Uh, so you will have more money, which you will then be able to grow into even more. So that's that's really the, the, the risk here is, um, is one of opportunity cost of like the lost opportunity of investing in something that will actually perform in this time period. So I don't think it's really one of valuations because a lot of these stocks are looking relatively inexpensive, but it's it that doesn't in itself turn sentiment on its head. 
Um, how is Palantir going to do to rape? It says Gals, right? We can look at that as well. I've got a couple of uh, bits. I actually just did a video on, the, on, 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 on Palantir, which I'll put out a little bit later, but I'll throw out some of this stuff for you. I should mention, by the way, which I haven't yet, that the you should go to my website and you should take advantage of some of the free information I put on there. I just put the link in here. Uh, there are, for example, this Boost Your Investment Return step-by-step -step guide or as a free, free mini course is on there. And also the W Income course will launch officially on Monday and it's going to be really good fun. So if you want to take advantage of the pre-sale that will run out on Sunday, it'll never come back because the course will be launched. So there will no longer be a pre-sale. So that coupon code there is double income. So check that out. It's all on the website. Go to academy.org. Um, Shulis Joe is asking, how do you judge if a lawsuit is something a company can cope with? Uh, cash reserves? Yes, essentially cash, cash reserves. You know, NEO has what I don't know, six billion or something on the books. So if they're going to pay out a couple of hundred million sort of worst case scenario, it isn't going to be a really a big deal. That's the way I see that. I think from the way that's written, I don't think it has regulatory issues because they were fairly upfront about that there could be issues with that. And there's also a reality that some things don't work out when you invest in companies. So there's an inherent, I think, um, assumption that people who buy IPOs realize that not necessarily everything that a company promises with caveats will necessarily be delivered just because, you know, stuff change, changes, things happen. Now, Palantir Arc bought some more, which is absolutely marvelous. Uh, and, and you might think, I've already know that, but no, they actually bought more again. So this is from today, this morning, and they bought, here is a million shares for Arc K. Uh, can I highlight that? I don't know if I can. Uh, in in Gmail, you can't highlight in Gmail for some reason. And there is an there is more. There is more. There is another three hundred seventy five thousand shares here. So that's one point four million so far. And there is still more. Here is another sixty one thousand. So that's another you know million and a half shares or so uh, that they've just bought here. Let me highlight this. That will be the easier way of doing it. Palantir. Palantir, Palantir. Oh, no, no. So it's more. It's 1 million. It's 2 million. <laughs> so it's like 2.4 million, almost 2.5 million shares they bought again. So they are definitely very bullish on this. And this chart actually from ARK doesn't show it yet. And I know I'm covering it with my head. Sorry about that. Uh, but this actually does not show the, the last two and a half million shares. So this there's going to be more. It's really going to be up here somewhere uh, up in the sky. So that's definitely good news, I'd say. Uh, that gives us some, you know, some confidence. A lot of people do follow the ARC news. Uh, they're not ma market makers really, but, you know, it, it does have something in it. Now, what happened yesterday? Well, we did sell off 1.6%. But I was actually reasonably happy with that because we've really jumped up after earnings, right? We have this massive jump up here, 11.5% uh, up, and we lost only 1.6% of that. And why do I like it? Because you can you see that tail here. That tail on that last candle means that we dropped really low to like 23.80 or something. And then people were bought back in to close the day at 24.50. So to me, that's positive. It means that there is actually support here between 23.80 and 24.50 where we closed. So this is not bad news. And then also down here, you can see that the volume of the sell-off day is less than the previous day, which was basically a zero day and definitely a lot less than the big green day here. So not that many people are selling. So I'm feeling a little bit more confident there on Palantir. Now, this morning, everything is looking red. So that's not really Palantir's fault. Let me find the pre-market stock screen up. So this is the live ticker here. The only thing that's up basically is, is volatility, uh, VIX here. And then what's down the most? Well, all the Chinese stuff. Uh, and NEO down 3% here. Palantir down 2.3%. They seem to be always kind of attached to the kind of more volatile side of the market, you know, your sort of Teslas and so on. I don't think it really makes sense, but this is just the market talking at the moment. So I don't think this is something that's, I don't worry about it personally because I just think the market is having one of those mornings. And Glenn, you are completely right. And you posted that on the on the Discord earlier. I saw that, Glenn. Thank you very much for sharing uh, that Munich, Munich uh, bought some more 
in his position. Um, and yeah, those guys have a very long-term horizon, right? So they they have lots of money and they just put it into good companies and then they wait. I mean, we're at 176. Incredible. Is it possible we might go to 150 or something like that? I think it's possible, yes. So for me, I haven't got quite as much money as Manish Patel. So I am waiting a little bit longer for this whole saga to be out and I'd rather pay a little bit more and get the rally up and get a quicker return than sit on this for a year and then not go anywhere. Glenn is saying, is the Belt and Road dead because of Afghanistan? No, that's a small part of it. So the Belt and Road isn't all about roads. It's also a lot about ports and lots of, about lots of infrastructure that essentially connects China with sort of the rest of the world. So Afghanistan is a small part of that. And uh, I, I don't think that was ever really critical. Uh, sort of places like Sri Lanka and India and Pakistan are probably bigger parts of that uh, and, and Eastern Africa and, and so on, all of Southeast Asia and, and you know, Russia and all these places. So, uh, or, you know, Eastern Europe and, and so on. So I, I think it's just a small part there. And so I, I don't think that's going to really scupper the whole thing. Um... Uh, yeah, buddy said, why doesn't you have a lawsuit against them? Okay, I just went through that. Maybe you want to skip back about five minutes. Uh, I, I will do a quick recap of that in a moment. But um, we'll, we'll definitely, yeah, we'll definitely do a recap. No worries. Blake says, is asking, are there instances where an increase in institutional bias is bad for a stock? Not really. I mean, unless you have particularly unpleasant institutions, you know, they are, have, have, they are known for like um, pulling companies apart or, you know, for dumping them um, within a week of buying them or something like that. But no, otherwise, otherwise institutional ownership is good. You, you, you want them. You want their money. They are like 80% of the market still. So you want the institutional money. Glenn is asking, can we, can we look at um, Aina? Absolutely. So that is, in my view, a... Um, that's a Spanish airport operator, isn't it? So um, Glenn is one of our lovely Discord members, and he asked that earlier whether you could ask the question live. And of course you can. So am I right on that? Is that? Yes, exactly. exactly. Okay, so they own um, airports in the UK and in Spain, and they operate them. And that's really the business. So if you go back a little bit over time, it's been a reasonably successful business. You might remember that over the last, well, Probably about 10 years ago, infrastructure became a really sexy thing and airports were, were one of those things. So if you bought this in 2015, you would have made 91%. Not brilliant over, over, over that time period, over six years, but still not, not horrific. Now, they've obviously, they were up here at sort of 150% up and then COVID happened and that isn't brilliant when you're operating airports. So the question therefore is, is this one of those things that we should now be buying or not, right? I think, Glenn, that's really what you're, you're talking about here. So, of course, it is relatively cheaper than what it was. The What I would really look at is the business profitability and so on pre-COVID. Um, so... I don't know if I can pull this up because I don't know if I have data for, hang on, they have an over-the-counter listing in New York. Maybe I can get the data. Yes, I think I probably can. So if we look at their financials and we look at a couple of years of earnings and we look at, um, let me look at margins. No. Okay, well, we can look at net income to do, 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 EBIT. Okay, so what's their revenue, say, in 20... Let's look at years. So 2019, they had 5 billion revenue, and they made a gross profit of 4.2 billion. So that's marvelous, you'd think, right? That's a really lovely margin. That's like 85% or something. Net income was 1.6 billion. Uh, so that's pretty good, right? So they were actually very profitable. 1.6 over 5. That was a 32% net income margin. That really isn't too shabby. And that was growing. That was growing each year uh, as revenue was growing also each year. So actually, they're becoming more profitable. They were becoming more efficient. So 
it looks as a, as a sort of snapshot that the underlying business is a good one, as long as people start flying again. Now, what about money? So they, this is how much cash they had. They had almost no cash last year. They've obviously done some fundraising. They've obviously I don't know, have they issued bonds or convertible shares or something because they're back to a billion and a half in, in cash. So therefore, they are probably not going to run out of money. Let me see how much they are burning at the moment. They only lost last year $200 million. That's, again, that's, a, that's fairly well managed considering that, you know, hardly anybody was flying in Europe. So, yeah, I'd say it looks like a solid thing to do. Um, you know, how, how cheap are you getting this? I suppose that's really also the question. So if you measure this from sort of pre-COVID levels, to where we are right now, you're getting it at a 20% discount. So if you love the stock anyway, and if you were always going to buy this, then this is not a bad thing to purchase, I, I, I would say. But you have to really dig a little bit deeper into the underlying business there, I'd say, Glenn. Uh, gaming with HB, you're asking, I, I'm German originally. I live here in Hong Kong, so I have a strange accent, which I apologize profusely. Um... All the way up is saying Barber is possible at 165. I, I think I think you are quite right there, unfortunately. Uh, Luke is asking, EV car companies usually do better at the end of the year. So you are right that people buy a lot more cars at the end of the year in, in Q4. Now, does that mean that the stock price performs much better in Q4? F three and four. Well, you could test that theory, right? So we could say, so say sep last year, September to the end of the year. Okay, yeah, that was that was tremendous, right? So this this triangle here is, is that growth then. Let's go back one year and test your theory in 2020. Now we're going to have to make this a little bit bigger because our stock price has gone up so much. Now, Neo might not be the most brilliant one to look at here, actually, because they had a lot of issues at the time. But in from September to the end of the year, they did go up a bit. Yes, they did. They went from $3 to sort of 5 That's actually more than a bit. So what I would do is I would go through a bunch of these stocks and go back sort of three, four, five years uh, and see whether you are you are right there, or you could find an, an EV ETF and, uh, and do that with it. Uh, I do think momentum is likely to improve at the end of the year, just because we are going to get much, much more marvelous numbers than we have at present. Um, Hans says, hit that like button, and he's absolutely right. Smash that like and subscribe button, guys. We only have 69 likes and 240 people watching. Come on, we can get that up to 100, surely. Um, imagine how happy I'll be when we get to 100 likes. I'll be, I'll be thrilled, ecstatic, uh, and I'll be answering even more questions. So let's have a look at NEO a little bit more short term, not, not back uh, over quarters and quarters and quarters. So let me zoom in a little bit more here. And lots of lines in here. So what have we got, really? Well, we obviously have a pretty substantial sell-off. Where is our support uh, is, is really the next question. We are at now markets open. Uh, we are at 37.18. So let's have a quick look just here at uh, the open market, see what's actually happening when trading begins. Okay, so education stocks are, are going down the, the, the drain, which is where they belong at present. Neo down 3.5% at 37.24. So let's go back to Neo here. So that's just, I think, market sentiment here. I, I don't think this is really anything particularly Neo related. Or oh, people are starting to read more about this car crashing and about this lawsuit, which I'll do another recap on in, this, in a moment. Now, what I don't like about this sell off is it's a fairly substantial sell off. And at the same time, each day, our volumes increasing down here. So this is actually a fairly momentous sell-off. The sell-off has momentum. And we stopped yesterday. Our low yesterday, where we closed the day, was basically exactly the low of the 27th of July. So where I put that great big red arrow. And that was really the only real support that we had between you know, $31 and here, because 
if you see between here and there, there is nothing in this whole area, right? In this whole box, there is literally nothing in it. And that means we haven't got su support levels. So always better for stocks to do this uh, because each time you have one of these zags, you get some support. So that's a little bit the concern here is definitely lack of support. So you're kind of relying on Fibonacci lines here. And the next one, sits at $33. Uh, I do think $35 is a psychological big mark where I do think we are going to see some support. Uh, but hopefully we're not going to go that far. I mean, that's that's, a, that's still a long way to go. So what are we seeing today? We are seeing today we've dropped lower and we are now moving back up. So we are near at the top of the candle, which again means that there is some support when we drop substantially lower than where we are right now. So today, our low was 36.80 and people are buying when it hits goes below $37. Uh, Simon says, I wish I had more money to buy in the dips. I mean, it's a it's a way of doing it, Simon, but as long as you have a strategy where you say are buying every month at the same time on the same days, uh, you will do very, very well in the long run as long as you have a reasonably diversified portfolio. And if you want to learn a little bit more about how to build that kind of portfolio, I teach you that down here in the Master Stocks course. So take advantage of the Build Wealth coupon. If you really want to know how to build lasting wealth, check it out. Uh, with all of my courses, you can try them out. You can go through the whole thing and you can tell me you don't like it. You get your money back. So there is really no risk here because I want to make sure you're happy and I want to make sure that you guys are building more wealth and, um, and more income as well. Um, all the way up is asking, are we going to cover uh, ARVL? We can have a look at that. I think they are one of the better players in that segment, um, but they are not having a um, having a particularly good time of late, right? So they are just selling off. So they are going back down to, well, you know, $10 levels, which is where, where the whole thing began. So in a sense, the sort of gas is coming out of this uh, this whole EV rally or, or bubble, if you want to call it out a little bit. So, you know, these companies are not looking that expensive to me, actually, a rival. Uh, but it's still, these are very early stage companies, so there's still a lot of risk to that, and that's where they should be trading at a discount and not at, you know, evaluations like a company that's already uh, making a lot of money. Uh, Gary, have we talked Barber yet? Okay, let, let me, let's do a, a quick recap here on, on where we started. So I ran through a couple of reasons why things are, are looking a little bit gloomy this morning. Um, I'm not gloomy, but and I hope you are not too. It's just the way markets roll. Markets roll up and down. We've got US retail numbers in that are substantially worse than expected. So the retail sales month on month, we were expecting 0.3% decline and we got minus 1.1%. And then if you take out the automobile sales, it's not looking much prettier. We were expecting a slight increase and instead we got down 0.4%. And you might think that's not a lot, but compared to 0.1%, 0.4 is like five times worse, right? So it's, it, is, it is substantial. Uh, we've got lots of, co you know, COVID concerns. Um, you know, we are going to, everyone is going to need more booster shots. There could be more lockdowns and so on. Uh, Powell is speaking apparently on the health of the economy somewhere, somehow, which is never good. We've got also uh, Eric Rosengreen, uh, the, another Fed president, saying that we should reduce economic stimulus this fall. So that's pretty soon, right? That's like in two weeks' time. And we got lots of news out of China. We've got more regulatory stuff out there. We've got draft regulations on a consultation on tackling unfair competition and restricting use of user data. That, of course, isn't good news for anybody who has user data. So that's Baba, that's JD, that's Meta, and that's Tencent and everybody else in, in, in that space. And... Um, well, there's also Afghanistan happening, which is, of course, massively distracting to people and not exactly something that makes people feel chirpy and makes them feel like, you know, spending some money or investing necessarily. Uh, C Limited had some mixed results out. The earnings were worse than, than expected, but revenue was much better than expected. And also the active user growth is pretty good there. So um, probably positive in the long term, maybe not hugely positive for the day. Berkshire Hathaway is getting out of pharma, well, quite a lot of it at least, reducing st stakes in Merck, um, ABBV, Bristol Myers, and so on, uh, which is basically the smart seasoned 
aged value investor thinking, I've had a really good run here. I'm going to take my money uh, and, and leave the casino. And that's what he's doing. Even though, you know, booster shots and so on are going to make these guys more money, he is uh, is not going to take part in that. He's going to take his money. Uh, and we also have the SEC chair, Gary Gensler, uh, being more critical again of Chinese stocks and the risk of buying those. So that's definitely something that isn't marvelous. What is marvelous, though, is if you go to my website, go to goatacademy.org and download my free Boost Your Investment Returns step-by-step -step guide. It's entirely free, no questions asked ever, and, um, and it's marvelous. So you should check that out, and I'll put the link in the chat here again if you are too lazy to type and you just want to click on something. Now, what's the whole NEO lawsuit thing about? So in March 2019, NEO announced it wasn't going to be building a factory, its own factory after all. That led the share price to drop from $10 to $7. That led to a class action lawsuit by the class action lawsuit uh, specialists of uh, Rosen or something other, Rosen Law. And they basically have, a, have about a dozen of those going, at least, <laughs> I think, at the moment against everybody out there. And what do they do? Well, they are basically saying that in the IPO documents in the S1, Neo said we are constructing a factory and they didn't do it and therefore we want our money back and damages, I, I presume. So this is the actual screenshot I've taken out of the IPO filing, so we don't have to read the whole thing, in which they're saying, this is Neo talking at the time of the IPO, we are developing our own manufacturing facility in Shanghai, which we expect to be ready by the end of 2020, and it's being constructed by relevant Shanghai authorities, as in government. As a result, such construction is largely outside of our control, and it could experience delays or other difficulties. And they then have this whole long paragraph here, highlighted in green, about all the things that could go wrong, and that there is uncertainty about it, and it could, it could be suspended. And then down here, they also say, in, we know to the extent we are unable to successfully complete construction on time or at all and so on. So I think they made it fairly clear that there was certainly a risk that was th this thing would never get built. Uh, but the uh, lovely lawyers at Rosen are taking this to court and Neo filed for this to be dismissed without a hearing. And the judge said, mm, no. No, no, we're going to have a hearing. I'm, I'm a bit bored tomorrow. So, uh, just kidding. He didn't say that. But there is going to be a hearing on this. So, this is going to drag on somewhat. I don't think it's that big a deal. The worst case outcome here is a fine of something. And Neo has got cash. So, I don't think it's a big deal. But it's important to understand what this is really all about. And Desmond's saying the only people who benefit are, are those class action lawyers. Uh, yeah. And everybody gets like five pounds. I, I'm sort of with you on that one. But you know, that's the way the system works. I can't change it. Um, Luke says, is there someone living in the US who could explain the global sentiment towards what's happening in Afghanistan? Um, yeah, I, 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 I suspect that no one's particularly thrilled about this. Um, it's not exactly a success. We've been here 20 years. Look what we've achieved, is it? So I think it's just one of those things it's a little bit like a stock investment. You bought something and it went down for 20 periods and you're still holding on to it because somehow you think it's going to get better. So in a sense, I actually think they're doing the right thing because if you haven't managed to improve it over after 20 years, what are the hopes for the next 20 years? So it's a bit like investing. When you when you onto a dud, um, sell it. Uh, Law says sea limit is up with the earnings miss. Yeah, that's great. We're just we were just chatting on that uh, that uh, they they have very good forward guidance and revenue growth and active user growth is is, is fantastic. Um, and Shoeless Joe says if a lawsuit like that succeeds, you wonder how any early company can say what it wants to do. And I mean, I think that's the reality as well. And and you kind of would hope that a well, I suppose it's a jury, isn't it? Is it a jury? I think I think class action lawsuits are. And that's a little bit the problem with the system is if you were in front of a judge who was used to handling financial security lawsuits, he would just say, well, IPO investors should understand the risk. And there are lots of disclaimers in there saying that things may change. Right. So 
what we're talking about here. But when you talk to 12 people who are like average people on the street, they might not really appreciate what this is all on about. It's also a Chinese company. It talks about PRC law and these kind of things. So uh, you can, you know, make an emotional plea to those 12 lovely people and perhaps make them come to a conclusion that isn't 100% rational from the point of view of a more seasoned investor, right? So that's, 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 that's the risk with these class action lawsuits here. Uh, Shock City is saying that the Afghanistan situation is uh, Biden's taking heat on that from both sides, uh, and it's seen as a major stain on his on his um, his presidency. Yeah, it, look, it it definitely isn't well handled. I mean, I think you could place blame with everybody who was in a previously to that too. I'm not going to get into politics here, but I always think it's the guy at the end who gets the blame, uh, and I have no particular uh, love or dislike for for the man, but. It does seem strange that if you've been there for 20 years, you wouldn't have seen it coming, that it would only take a couple of days for everything would unravel, in which case you would have organized your withdrawal a little bit faster and you would have certainly taken out the civilians you wanted to move out first uh, rather than sort of, you know, having them hang around. So I think that's really um, the stuff that, that is going to leave a bad taste in people's mouth. Andy says China could benefit from Afghanistan. There is a lot of potential mining there, but nothing has ever really been done to scale because of the security problem. So in a sense, having the Taliban in government might actually make it secure for miners. So you were completely right. You could, in theory, have a Chinese miners going in there and, uh, and um, being reasonably safe. If the you know, Taliban guarantees security there. And uh, Yon Chu, I, I appreciate Yon Chu, you are, if you mind me saying, you are in the um, US military. Uh, so I, I, I can totally see the sort of um, disbelief, sadness, anger, because so many people have spent time there, lost their lives, or were injured or traumatized by the experience. And, you know, what is there to show for it? Um, that's sort of the problem, really, isn't it? Um, now, I mean, of course, you know, Osama bin Laden was captured but he was captured in Pakistan. <laughs> it was not necessary perhaps to go into Afghanistan for that. So yeah, that's, that's, uh, I, I can totally see why you're thinking that, uh, Yon Chu. And I was exactly, when I was seeing those pictures first, I was thinking, God, there are going to be hundreds of thousands of, uh, of American troops and actually troops from other countries as well who'd be thinking, what did we, you know, lose all that for? So let's go into more, more happy subjects here. <laughs> um, um, on, on what's happening in the market. So let's have a quick look at what's actually happening here live, and then we can run through some stocks if you guys want. So do feel free to shout them out, and we can definitely look at stuff. But this is looking really red, right? Actually, it's getting more green. When we started this call, there were only three things green. Now, Lee Auto is green, Xpang is green, a Coin Plug is green. So it is becoming a bit more greener as the day goes on. Apple is green, SOS, uh, and so on. So not everything is down. Uh, but it is moving. Look, Palantir now down only 0.4%. We were down 2.5%. So often pre-market, and I always say this again and again, pre-market is basically retail. Institutional investors very rarely invest in pre-market or even early in the day. So it's retail people like you and me. We see the news, we absorb it, we freak out, and we sell. And that's why you quite often have these really deep red days. And then people pick these stocks up during the day. So this is starting to look a little bit happier. Let's have a quick refresh here on futures. Um, okay, the futures are actually down more. It's just that the tech stocks are recovering a little bit more. Um, and orange juice still up. Can I show you a funny chart? Um, which might make you think that you're investing in the wrong thing. So this quarter... Oats are the outperformer. 39% a return with oats, 29.7% with coffee. Uh, for year to date, it's gasoline, ethanol, natural gas, all up in the 50%. Soya bean oil, canola, coffee, oats, heating oil. That's where the money is. It's not in stocks. Isn't that quite interesting that we are missing a whole environment there that we could invest into because we don't, we don't um, look at it and perhaps we don't really understand it. Um, Learning to Fly says, why do you think Neo is always having such big trading volumes? Well, they are just the bigger fish on, 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 in the pond. Basically, they are better known. They are um, 
you know, they are the, the, the leading Chinese EV brand. So it's sort of Tesla and then Neo, and then there is a lot of nothing. So that's why they just get a lot more volume. Uh, Shoeless Joe, is Lee Auto likely to branch out into foreign markets? You know what they announced? Lee announced that they're going to build a factory outside of China. They haven't decided where. They're looking around. Uh, but they want to do that. So they, yes, they, they do want to get international markets and they want to do it with cars built outside of China, which is uh, a really interesting move that hopefully the others are going to follow as well. Sh shock City Rocker Crocs is done well, really? Okay, let me, let me, I'm going to have to pull that up. Okay, where did my chart go? Here we go. Crocs. Those um, rather hideous um, sort of plastic shoes, right? Wow, yeah, that's incredible. That's that's up 1,500%. That's like Tesla. <laughs> what, are, what are they doing over there? Uh, that's insane. That really is insane. Should I, should I put Tesla on the same chart um, with the same, same percentage scale? Okay, we've got two Teslas now. Yeah, they've actually outperformed Tesla. <laughs> Who would have thought? You don't need technology. You just need Crocs. Uh, absolutely tremendous over that time period, at least. I mean, in more recent, yeah, you know, yeah. Since the beginning of the year, they are up 133%. Tesla is up like 1%. So uh, that's kind of an interesting one. I didn't know that. I didn't know that about that Crocs. Uh, gaming is saying Proterra. Okay, let me throw up Proterra here. Yeah, it, I mean, at this point, it's hard to see, at least from a uh, momentum point of view, how that recovers. When you get these kind of, you know, directions, it's quite hard to turn them around. You typically spend ages sort of wobbling around here, trying to build some sort of support level before you can get go, go, go up again. So yeah, I, I would think that would take quite a bit of time. And the earnings was uh, disappointing, right? It was, uh, it was massively disappointing. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't think that's going to go anywhere. Self-driving crocs, Desmond. There is a business idea, Desmond. Now I know what we need to do. We need to do AI self-driving crocs with LiDAR. Wouldn't that be something? And Simon, you, I absolutely agree with you there. That's a falling knife. Now, it might not go much lower than the sort of $9, $10 level because that's sort of cash levels, I imagine. I haven't looked at their balance sheet for a while, but they probably have that sort of underlying asset value there. But yeah, it's going to take some time. Alicia is asking TTCF, Tattoo Chef. Yeah, we've been asking about that a little bit lately. It's an interesting one. Um, it's highly, highly volatile. So the little bit of the problem is that this has been memed, I, I would say. So, you know, you have, I'd say you have this sort of long-term trajectory here and all the stuff above it is just madness. So, or... Is it is it somewhere down here? Is it is is that it? So the problem when you get this kind of insane volume, look at these volume bars here. They're just crazy, right? That sort of thing down there. For your average sort of normal investor who's just looking to buy something and hold it and make profits out of it, this is scary and it makes you run. And so you don't really want stocks with that sort of volatility, where you know you have these sixteen percent day downs and then you know you go up massively from. 14 to 26 in a couple of days and then back down again. And we do also have two earnings in a row, which are massive earnings, uh, sort of, you know, un underwhelming earnings. So that isn't great, two of those in a row. So therefore, would I buy this at this point? No, probably not. Um, now, you might think it's cheap, but who knows what the real value is of this thing? You know, maybe this is actually only worth $10 and the whole thing up here is just, you know, Reddit madness. So. Uh, Luke is saying, um, Alicia, uh, watch some uh, videos from Jeremy on financial education. Uh, he, I think he has a slightly higher risk profile than me, so he might be a little bit more uh, bullish on this. But yeah, sure, ch ch check him out. I'm, I'm sure he's put out something uh, sensible there. All the way up is 965. Okay. Palantir earnings predictions. 
Gaming with HP. We've just had Palantir earnings. What, 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 what do you want predictions for? <laughs> We've just been there. They were good. They were solid. Um, and did you know that they bought gold? They bought $53 million worth of gold in August, which is kind of interesting. And it kind of makes me think about the kind of the people who are running that. It's sort of strange. I wouldn't have thought that the Palantir guys would be buying gold. I thought they'd be buying like digital assets or something. But they're hoarding gold, literally $51 million worth of physical 100 ounce bars. So um, I've got a little tiny bit of gold here. You see this? Uh, this is gold. It's Chinese gold. This is, uh, they come in these lovely little round shapes. Uh, but yeah, so th their bars are like this big. They're like, you know, double bricks. So it's kind of interesting. Is Tesla a buy now, says Alicia. So let's have a look at Tesla here. I will show you the chart. Don't worry. I forget sometimes, but I will pull it up this time. If you are, by the way, interested in learning technical analysis yourself, it really isn't very difficult. I teach you all of that down in the Master Stocks course. Um, that's more for your long-term investors. If you are wanting to trade more actively and buy shares every couple of weeks or a couple of times a month at least, do it with options. It's a smarter way of doing it, especially around earnings seasons. There are some really insightful trades you can do there. So uh, check out the link below, felixfriends.org slash join, or just go to my website as well. I'm going to post the link in here as well. There's also tons of free stuff in the, uh, on there, free courses, free guides, and, and, and all sorts of things that I prepare for, for people. And so this is Tesla. Now, it's actually quite a nice recovery, really, isn't it? From $55 up, so we have this quite nice looking sort of chart here that I would put in about that way. And I would sort of say, this is our recovery. So we've fallen out of that chart now. So the question is, is really why? Well, it's a bit of sentiment. It's a bit of momentum. Uh, if I throw QQQ into this, then you can see, let me exaggerate QQQ a little bit here. Can I move QQQ? <laughs> there we go. So, fighting, fighting with charts, fighting with stocks. Okay. So, can you see the orange line is QQQ, right? So, you can see how that's falling off here the last two days, and that's why Tesla is falling off. Now, Tesla is always more volatile than the QQQ, so it exaggerates that sell-off. So, I like doing this because it makes me realize whether this is something that's really something to do with Tesla or just market sentiment. To me, this just says it's market sentiment and there isn't really anything wrong with Tesla per se. Uh, we have pretty good support levels here if we did dip down this low at 620 because we've got like these two days here, right bang on the line. It's also Fibonacci line. There is also some in between that. I'm not saying we're going to go that low. So there is support here at 643 and also at 661. So I'd say those are basically our three uh, bearish uh, support levels for, for Tesla here. Um, Alicia, I'm glad you appreciate it. I mean, literally, you know, we can look at lots of indicators and things like that too and, and try to get a sentiment. But when you get these sharp drops down, you actually already know what the, the indicator is saying. Well, maybe, maybe you don't. Uh, to, to me, it seems obvious. So basically, that purple line here, it fell below the green line here, which I put in at the halfway mark at minus 50. And that gives you a sell signal, right? So this gave you a sell signal basically yesterday, which was a fair call, right? Yesterday, this was at $709. Today, we're at 665. So it was a good time to get out. And let me put a line in here and let me show you when it told us to get in. So it told us to get in when that purple line crossed the green line on the 28th of August. So the 28th, you would have bought this at about 640. You would have gotten out at about 700. That's pretty good, right? That's like 10% almost or 9% in a couple of days. And now you're out again. So you can use these quite usefully to trade or at least position when you want to get in on stuff. I would do it with more than one indicator because it gives you a little bit more insight. It, it, it makes it more accurate. So if, on, on that, I'd highly recommend um, Master Stocks course down below because that's really where I teach you a huge amount of technical analysis to take you really from total beginner to being very, very advanced um, on that. So if you want to do some swing trading or something like that. Uh, does VIX follow TA, uh, says Noah? Yes, absolutely. You could totally do technical analysis on VIX. Absolutely. Uh, it's, of course, also an indicator. So VIX is basically a future 
um, on volatility. So it tells you what's happening over the next couple of weeks and month, one month in terms of volatility. It always overstates volatility. So if, if you are an options trader, uh, the premiums are priced on the basis of volatility in the market. So because they are priced on VIX, VIX overstates on average uh, volatility by about 4%. This is over the last like 20, 30 years. It's, it's just lots of articles on this. It's, it's, it's more or less a fact. Uh, there's lots of research on this, which means that if you're buying options, if you're buying calls, say, you're overpaying. You're always paying about 4% more than you should. So that's why I don't buy options. I only sell options. So you can structure the same trades, but you can sell things instead, or at least you can be a net seller. And that way you are automatically doing 4% better than someone who's buying options and it's it's a, it's a really a totally risk-free way of doing it so i'd highly recommend that and again i'm going to have to point here to the options trading course down below because again i teach you how to options trade so uh, can you touch on baidu says a i a i think you picked that name so that you would always be first, right? Which is a really smart thing to do. Like if you set up a company, uh, make it start with A or a double A or a triple A because you will always rank first in every directory, in every listing. So um, that's a smart thing to do, A. Now, why is Baidu doing this? This, this basically collapse back down to you know late 2020 levels. I had it up here earlier on the screen I had some notes up here. So there are two things that are hitting Baidu here. One is that the SEC chair, Gary Gensler, has issued another warning about Chinese companies. So obviously that affects the whole sector. And Baidu is very much a Chinese company. Secondly is that there is a draft regulation, or actually draft regulations, um, out in China uh, inviting public opinion on unfair competition and also um, on how to restrict user data. So how does somebody like Facebook or Google make all their money? They use our user data and they use it to sell adverts, say, right? So Baidu is a similar business in a sense to Google, actually quite similar. Also uh, leaders in autonomous driving and things like that. So they need to use our user data and be able to repackage that and repurpose that to sell products, to sell advertising. And if that is restricted, it's harder for them to make money or perhaps their advertising product becomes less exciting. So that isn't great news for them. And then the unfair competition, Baidu, just like Google, dominates search in China. And so, I mean, like Google does in the rest of the world, uh, you know, I think Google has like, was it 92% market share or something like that? Insane. I think 5.4 billion searches are made in Google a day. So Baidu is the same thing for China. If you are going to draft legislation that attacks unfair competition online, who are you targeting? You're targeting the guys with 80, 90% market share, right? So Baidu definitely falls within that. So there is a lot of headwinds, therefore, for stocks like Baidu. And I think this is going to continue. And I personally wouldn't buy this dip because I think this is a slide. And I think this will continue to be a slide uh, for some time, probably until the end of the year, maybe until Chinese New Year in February or so. Uh, at some point, the Chinese government is going to draw a line under this, though if you believe UBS, they put out something over the weekend saying, we think this is going to take years to bring all the regulation in China up to sort of uh, standard. So I personally... I'm not buying this. You know, look at Baidu. They had marvelous earnings, right? 17% earnings surprise. And each of the earnings have been really good. They're always like that, yet we are falling off uh, and lost all of the gains of the last year, basically. Um, and Desmond, ah, that is why Apple is AAPL. Whenever I want to put Apple the ticker in, I always type in APP and then it doesn't, it doesn't exist. Uh, you are right. That's a smart thing of, uh, of Apple to do. Simon is saying, so China's doing what the EU wanted to do to control tech companies and they get a flag for it, essentially. I mean, essentially, China is bringing their legislation up to European and to American standard. That's the irony, that they're actually borrowing huge parts of the playbook. If you read the antitrust legislation, it reads very similar to the European antitrust legislation or, or the American one. So 
they didn't have this regulation because no one's ever regulated the whole internet and tech space. So it's not that they shouldn't do it. It's just they're doing it all at the same time. And it's obviously a sentiment issue for us. Uh, Marquez is asking, does Palantir invest in those SPAC companies in return for them to use their software? I think it's a little bit like that. So I don't think it's sort of like Palantir knocking on the door going, please use our software and we'll give you some money. I think it's a little bit more, look, I mean, they have Peter Thiel behind there, right? He's a very, very smart investor and a massive venture capitalist through all those funds, who, by the way, have just sold loads of Palantir. But that's another story here. So they are identifying potentially really great uh, you know, young startup companies who could really benefit from Palantir. So th at the beginning, they couldn't afford it because there wasn't a subscription model. So Palantir went in and rather than so they're paying a little bit in cash, but they're also paying in kind. So rather than the company paying Palantir 5 million a year for the software, Palantir is providing the software for perhaps zero and getting equity instead. So it's sort of a fair trade. Some of the newer um, SPACs or, or startup companies that they are investing in under this um, Foundry for Builders program, which is not the greatest name, is it? Because it makes me think of bread bricks uh, and you know hard hats. Those guys are actually paying subscription revenue. So I think in the earnings call, they said they were getting $3 million last quarter from all of those startup companies as revenue. So it's not massive yet, but there is an opportunity there. Desmond is saying there's no here, nowhere to hide. Wait uh, until uh, Chinese New Year. I'm kind of with you on that one, Desmond. I, I think we are going to have to sit Chinese shares out sort of till the end of the year uh, and then um, take advantage of that. EVs might be a different story. I think the EVs might be a little bit special here, but I definitely think with things like Baidu. Um, a is saying the regulation should be a positive thing. Look, if you are the dominant market player and they're going to make regulation a lot more difficult and expensive for others to get into, then it is. So it depends on the regulation. So say if you're a fintech company and they're raising the amount how much money you need to have or the regulatory staff are making it means you have to employ 200 people, 200 lawyers, 300 accountants before you even started. You've just created a barrier to entry. That's a good thing. Things like user data, not necessarily so good. <laughs> so I think, you know, there are good parts and they're not so good parts. But Desmond, yeah, again, you see, Desmond says, well, I, I'm going to think in advance. You know, we are, we, are, we are connected, aren't we, Desmond? And that's what happens when you are a part of the membership and the Patreon for more than six months. You see, Desmond's still six plus there. Uh, come and join the, the, the Discord, guys, uh, through, through the Patreon. Uh, the link is also below. And Rudy is saying, let's move to 2031 and see how Baba has fared. And yeah, I'm also with you on that, Rudy. I think a good, profitable company uh, will be an even better company then. Uh, but there is some opportunity cost issues here, I would say. So let's have a quick look at how the market is rounding up here. Education getting punished, Baidu and so on getting punished. Neo, where was it? Palantir down 1.4%, Neo down 2% at the moment. And actually, yeah, the whole market looking pretty, pretty miserable again, pretty red, pretty bleak. Um, but remember, this is just a day or two. This is how the market zigzags. This is not the end of the world. Uh, this happens all the time. Look at the charts. These are basically one year charts, no one day charts. Look at the month. Ah, okay. So this is about a year, and you can see we've had a pretty good run, right? S&P 500, NASDAQ, everything is actually done really, really very, very well. So we can't really uh, complain. And you see the dips. You see the big dips. You see the small dips. And if you average it out to months over time, again, it's a, it's a money-winning story to be in the market. Uh, you just have to be reasonably diversified. You have to buy companies that are good companies with good margins, good free cash flow, and that have a good moat. Uh, and if you want to le learn what those are and how you can find out yourself and how you can read those financial statements and so on, uh, take my Master Stocks course down below because I teach you all of that. And of course, I also share with you my strategy and my portfolio and everything else. And you also get to join our marvelous um, st student member only chat groups where you can ask me things absolutely any time of the day. And I will definitely reply you. And I, I know a lot of you guys here already in that community. So I truly appreciate you for that. 
thank you for tuning in. Uh, please hit that like button on the way out. I would mean the world to me and to, to the YouTube algorithm. And I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Same time, same place. Uh, and we you know we might just see the rebound tomorrow. We might see it this afternoon. Who knows? See you tomorrow, guys. Thanks for tuning in.